session. Uh, and there we are, it's recorded, started now. So there are three main approaches that we'll be looking at with the peer assessment tool, which is a dedicated tool within the Blackboard VLE, that's Yorkshire, uh, for peer assessment. We're looking at some of the pros and cons of that tool. Also using the blog tool, it's a very commonly used tool for all sorts of collaborative learning, but um, in this context for uh, peer assessment and feedback. And then one of the other functionalities of the VLE is something called adaptive release, which can be used to um, release model answers once students have submitted a piece of work um, or actually contributed towards a blog. And we'll look at the way that that might uh, be used as a way of more self-reflective um, self-assessment rather than peer assessment. I'm also going to throw in very quickly at the end um, a plus one, uh, which is an alternative approach to use Google Docs, though there are some significant disadvantages to using that approach. So the first question I have for you, if you wouldn't mind, just using the chat, uh, text chat box, or you can stick up your hand and open up your microphone and tell me out loud, why are you interested in peer assessment? So I'll give you a couple of minutes for typing in that, or stick up your hand and turn on your mic. Okay, so we've got a few suggestions there. So Michelle, um, students are interested in using peer assessment. Michelle, what department are you from? Wayne said English, so that's brilliant. Um, so there's uh, there is definitely some uh, interest there. Um, we'll look at. I've got actually a slide coming up in a minute about student perceptions of of um, peer assessment, and there are lots of papers online about that, um, which show that there's there's an also a motivational aspect to it. Um, so Tamlin's mentioned their useful way for students to develop their academic skills, so their writing skills and the way that they can um, critically analyze work. Um, Lillian Blow has uh, from computer science, um, so learning tool for learning programming, and certainly you could use this as a way of sharing programming resources and then providing feedback on that. And Kathy's mentioned there a way of introducing group work presentations to the English department. I think you can use some of these approaches I'm going to show you today for that aspect, absolutely, because with the presentation presentation is only the end product. So there's all that work that goes up to a presentation as well. And even within a presentation, you could still use a few of the techniques I'll point out today on both engaging um, student feedback in class, but also what would happen after the, the presentation as well. So we, we'll, we'll definitely include something on that there. Right, so let's begin with uh, having a look at some of the student perceptions here. Now, there are, as I said, there are a number of papers that look at student staff perceptions of peer assessment. Some of those will be the old fashioned sort of paper-based peer assessment, and others will be specifically for online. But there's one paper that I picked out here, which I think uh, gave us some food for thought really to start off um, thinking about the role of peer assessment and the way that tools can support that. The idea how perhaps peer assessment can support a transformative effect on um, students' perceptions of assessment and feedback as well. And we always have assessment and feedback as quite a negative um, response in NSS, or perhaps not as highly positive as other aspects of the NSS. So could peer assessment be a way to actually get students to think about the role of assessment, but also the role of both the staff member and the student in that assessment and feedback process? So as the quote here says, it's hard to judge people's work. And there's a bit of an appreciation there that actually assessment isn't always uh, a definitive science, it can be a bit of a fine art instead. I really like the second point of this quote, where it talks about the way that um, when you're writing an answer, you need to convince people of your argument, convince them that your answer is actually answering the question being set. And that's a self-reflective, perhaps a learning process there that students are going through when they're marking other people's work, but it also reiterates the point that you're, you're being assessed against certain criteria too. So there are some um, learning actions that are coming to come out of doing um, peer assessment, and what I want to emphasize these learning actions throughout the tools that I'm going to show you. Now, these particular perceptions were elicited through um, an evaluation exercise. They weren't actually um, surfaced during any form of learning activity. So you might want to actually consider how getting students to reflect on their learning through the peer assessment is also a valuable exercise. 
So learning through peer assessment, um, McGar and Clifford suggest that it actually supports a critically supportive dialogue. So looking at the way that um, work can be challenged from a critical perspective, but also the acts of feedback supporting students' development. And with the peer feedback here, it's a two-way process. There's ownership of the learning process giving out to the students so they can support each other. And the idea is that by working together and offering their feedback on students' work and reflecting on their own work, that students are learning from each other in a social constructive way. So it's greater than just learning individually whatever's in your head and self-reflecting. You're building upon other people's ideas as well. However, the utilisation of the feedback is still an issue. So um, just like they are with tutor marked assessments, um, and Walker explored some of the issues, boiling it down to either there's a problem with the feedback or there's a problem with the student. And I think you can mitigate both of those things uh, one way or another. So one is mitigated, mitigated against by using very clear instructions, setting expectations, and the other is about aligning formative tasks between doing formative peer assessment with some form of summative assessment at the end. So there's a clear link between the development activity going on as part of peer assessment and then what the students are going to then do afterwards. So all those sorts of issues will pick up in the workflows we'll look at some of the tools. So I've got three forms of learning from the bits of literature that I've had a look at. Uh, one is to do with the accuracy of marking, and that's getting students familiar with the uh, marking criteria. And McGar and Clifford found this was actually a trait um, amongst the undergraduates they use peer assessment with. So the undergraduates um, spent most of their time making sure their feedback was the right sort of feedback aligned to the marking criteria. Another alternative approach that McGar and Clifford looked at was with postgraduate students where they were using um, peer feedback to demonstrate their ability to give feedback. So these students were actually training to be teachers, so there's actually a, a professional aspect to this, this learning activity. But you could apply that equally to other disciplines. So the idea of critiquing someone else's work, the other idea of critiquing someone else's practice, peer feedback and peer assessment plays part in that. And finally, um, as I've touched upon already, this idea of a reflective learning process. So when you justify comments to uh, justify your feedback comments when you're delivering feedback to peers, but also reflecting on your own position, reflecting on the work that you've submitted and whether you can justify that in uh, and against the feedback that you received. So Kikanti and Morrow um, have a good explanation of, of that particular learning approach. So another question for you now before we move into the tools is what do you want to want to achieve through using peer assessment? So not necessarily why you're doing it, but what do you want the students learning to achieve? Um, that's the question I'm asking you now. What learning do you want to happen? So pop that into the text chat box or you can raise your hand and open your mic as well. So Lorene, you've put in there richer learning processes in the classroom. What do you mean by that? Do you have a specific example in mind? I mean, Tamman makes an interesting point there about getting students as part of this process to think about how they're producing work. So it's the process, not just the product. And that's something that's actually come out of um, quite a lot of literature around peer assessment. And particularly when you're doing it online, the tools enable you to surface that process. So you're not just looking at the end product. And Kathy's looking there at the idea of um, the marks being allocated from different students contributing to an overall mark and that's something actually the uh, the idea of do, delivering a presentation and getting um, feedback from the audience who you deliver it to is actually quite a good learning process because then you you know whether you've met your own aims I suppose in the presentation as well so Lillian's got on there how um, analyzing correcting 
code is a key skill. So this goes back to that example I pulled up a minute ago about the um, teacher training students where they're developing their skills that they're going to be using in their future practice. The same sort of applies with what Lillian's saying there uh, about computer science students and being able to assess the validity of a particular solution, a particular way of programming. Okay, thanks very much for your contributions there. So the first tool to show you um, is actually, I'm gonna drop something into the uh, chat tool as well. Um, all the way throughout this, um, the link I'm providing there is the technical guidance to using um, Blackboard's, um, that's Yorkshire's uh, peer assessment tool. But the workflow is on the screen now. So this peer assessment tool, the lecturer will create a submission point with an assessment task and specific marking criteria. Then students would submit their work online and that's in a very defined period of time. So you have to open the window for say a week and then students can submit their work and that closes and then they can do the peer assessment stage. So they would then use certain criteria to assess the student work against that. After the review window closes, the students then come back into the peer assessment point and then collect their feedback. So the idea of using this tool is to engage students with marker and criteria, perhaps engage students with reviewing criteria and have a better understanding of how that criteria applies to their own work as well. This particular workflow can be completely automated. Um, so, and actually it's designed that way, so it is completely automated. So you as a, a lecturer don't have to go in and fiddle around with deadlines and things. And um, actually provides uh, space for students to post comments on each other's work as well in a very structured way. So one aspect of this I'd like you to consider though is what happens after the activity. So once you, because it's very sort of independent of you as an instructor, what would you then do as an instructor to take the learning from that activity forward? So Cathy's just posed a question there, um, does each student know who has allocated which feedback or is it anonymous? Well, one advantage of the peer assessment tool within the VLE is that it's completely anonymous. And um, that has its advantage and disadvantage that we'll look at in a minute. So the way this works, um, in the VLE, you would just go to the uh, a space on your VLE site, go to assessments and then self and peer assessment. Don't worry about too much about the step-by-step -step during this webinar, we've got the guides for all that, but I just wanted to give you an overview of how um, everything pieces together. And then from a student perspective, it would appear on their VLE space like this, and they would click on this view and complete assessment link. Um, and they'd go into the pages to submit their work and then once the submission window is closed they'd then go in again and they'd be able to download another student's work and then complete um, the assessment feedback, complete the feedback for the assessment based on the criteria that you as an instructor have provided. So in this case here this example has got three pieces of criteria that, that would be um, included and then the student can write some feedback to their peer and they could also give it a mark. Now there does need to be a mark that's attached but it can just be uh, made up, you could just put one point in so it doesn't mean anything. Um, there's some debate actually as to whether what's more important is the mark or the feedback and as we looked at in that example from uh, Magar um, and Clifford where students are spending too much time w working on getting the right mark and not enough time on thinking about the value of the feedback. So this would be very good as Lorena uh, put in the text chat, text chat there, uh, good for formative assessment because you're then getting students to work through a particular um, assessment, think about the criteria and then use that criteria in their summative assessment as well. So there are some considerations. Uh, first of all, uh, if you have, say, a cohort of 50 and 40 students submit, you'll have 10 students who don't submit. The way this does automatically is it doesn't filter off the students who haven't submitted. So there is a little bit of an overhead, I think, from your perspective and instructor, you might want to go in there and um, see which students have and haven't submitted and get them to submit. Uh, before the deadline closes because you can't actually exclude a user from an allocation. So when the work is being allocated to other students, you can't, alloc you can't exclude 
a student who hasn't submitted any work. So if I was going in as a student, going to assess someone else's work, what will happen is I might get to someone's work and realise they've not submitted it at all, and therefore there's no opportunity for me as a student to provide feedback. I don't learn anything from that peer feedback process. So really, I'd say this works only if you've got a smaller group of students who are very committed and you can essentially filter off the students who aren't going to be um, engaging with this activity. One of the recommendations which actually follows on from that is actually to allow students access to all the submissions and then um, they only need to assess one but it will give them access to all submissions to review except for their own. Uh, that's one important point as well. You can exclude students own submissions so they're not having to assess their own work. One of the considerations for the tool is that deadlines cannot be changed once they have passed. So unlike other submission tools on the VLE where you can extend the deadline, with this the deadlines are set in stone when the tool is created. So there's a little bit of a technical flaw there that, that, that sort of prevents some um, adjustment if you have late submissions. So it will only allow submissions up to the deadline and not um, afterwards. And it also doesn't work with um, VLE groupings. So there are some considerations here which might prevent you from using this particular tool, but I think if you've got a small group um, where you have um, very motivated students and, and you've developed that motivation with the students to learn from each other, this could be a quite an easy and, and simple way of sharing work between each other. Um, the, if you wanted to look at this in person, you can just set this up on a VLE site and use your preview user, your test preview student, to experience that. Um, if you've never used preview user before, it's at the top um, right of your VLE site. There's a little eye icon which will switch you into student mode, so you get the experience from a student angle. So you can set up the tool as an instructor and then experience it as a student. Uh, one approach might be to have, if you've got a large cohort, to have um, a separate site just for the peer uh, assessment activity. That will allow you to then remove the users who didn't submit from the VLE site and therefore when students go in to assess each other's work, you know for sure that you've only got valid submissions there, you've not got blank submissions. So it's a little bit complicated in, in some respects, but I think from the, uh, the advantages of this are quite clear in that you can have a completely automated workflow. So another tool which might be more appropriate, if you particularly if you've got larger cohorts, is to use the blog tool. So um, I'll give you the link to the, the guides for setting up blogs in the text chat there. And we've actually got some case studies on uh, blogs and our guides. I'll just put that in there as well. So um, feel free to uh, look at those later. So the idea with the blog tool then is it's a space where everyone in the course has access. Students will post something, so creating posts on the blog, and then other students can come in and provide comments on those blog posts. As an instructor, you can view a list of all the students and how many blog posts they've submitted, and you can also link this with the Grade Center to, in, to give you an indication of which students have and haven't submitted as well. So the idea is that you create the blog tool, um, for a particular group, or if you're looking at individual students, um, it will be a journal-based um, space. Then students are required to post to these spaces. For example, if you're doing some sort of presentation development, you might want to have students post uh, the literature review or some sort of elaboration on what they'll be doing in a presentation as a specific post within the blog. Um, or you could do this on a more reflective um, aspect, for example, a seminar-based uh, blog activity where students are asked to reflect on um, the contributions to the seminar or some of the key points that came out of the seminar, and then other students would respond to those posts, commenting on the thoughts and ideas and providing suggestions. That could be uh, questioning the students on what they've posted. For example, what did you mean by this? Um, have you considered this other theory? Those are the sorts of things that other students could post uh, in response to students commenting. So subsequent uh, posts will then respond to students' insights. So um, you have to respond then to the comment provided by other students, and closing that feedback loop and getting students to reflect on the learning. So here we have um, a space that could be used not just for text, but could be used for other resources. So you could get students to post links to videos, upload images, upload presentation files, 
align them to the requirements of the assessment task but you as an instructor will need to make sure that those requirements are really clearly and um, specified as well so if you're asking students to post very regularly set that out on the VLE that as in you will need to post by this date comments on the post will need to be by this date and you will need to respond to those comments by that date so it's a really structured um, way of students to use this process so the idea then is to show how students have changed their thinking and this again goes back to that social constructivist type of pedagogy where students are learning from each other and one of the great ways you can do this is by asking students to include a reflection within their summative assessment and I actually did this when I was doing my MA studies um, with the OU um, we always had to include uh, some indication of where our thinking had changed as a result of the discussions that we had online in discussion forums and that was part of the assessment criteria at the summative stage as well so here's the blog tool um, it exists within the tools menu within your VLE sites you just choose blogs there if you're doing a group blog or a journal if you're doing a one-to-one -one between the student and the tutor um, but when you're setting up a blog you put in all your instructions as I've mentioned there the expectations are clear step-by-step -step guidance and you get some further settings so ones to watch out for because they're not always set by default the big one to watch out for is this one here the blog type and by default it's normally set to individual to all students and that means that only students can see their own um, or rather I should say that the blog is ordered so that um, you view each student's blog post independently if you have some group working you probably want to set that to a course uh, blog or use a group blog which is another type of blog um, but the course blog will allow everyone to see everything on one page so again depends on the scalability of your cohort if you've got a small group then use the course setting if you've got a big group divide them up into groups on the VLE and then have group based blogs one of the other features is to set up a grade column a grade center column for your blog and this will allow you to use participation in the blog to trigger further events so by participating in a blog um, students could then have access to some sort of other activity that could be a, a test uh, or um, an exam preparation activity it could be something like a model answer anything like that so having that set up is actually quite a, a good function and then you can monitor that as well to see down one column who has and hasn't submitted to the blog and it looks like this from the student perspective you've got your instructions at the top and then you have a post and then to the post another student will comment and type their comments there and then the original student could then comment after that as well and a list of all the posts will appear in the index and you can also click this link at the top um, to filter by individual students and that list will bring up which students have posted the most but you can use the grade center column as well so some of the considerations here um, monitoring is easy oops excuse me I just uh, advanced too far there. monitoring blog is easy uh, but the monitoring only accounts for the posts does not account for the commenting side so if your focus is on um, assessing students feedback to other students this might not be the right tool for you um, you don't allocate work to individual students so it's essentially here's a big load of student work find a, a post that you're interested in and respond to it so again not as structured as the peer assessment tool however it does work much better for larger cohorts groups of 10 to 15 divided up that way um, you can set really clear expectations of engagement and you will need to do that in terms of when to submit when um, but the blog could also be used um, to release other resources because of that grade center integration I'm just going to pause for a moment there um, are there any comments or questions at the moment on either the peer assessment tool or the blog feel free to just stick up your hand and let me know if you're going to type in or um, ask a question over the mic okay we're going deadly silent so I'm going to carry on so uh, the next function of the VLE which might be useful um, maybe not so much for well maybe what actually for peer, peer assessment but also for self-assessment is the use of adaptive release now adaptive release could be used to release 
other resources. So if a student submits a piece of work, you get access to quizzes or in this case here, a model answer. And in this case, uh, the model answer would be released, but um, I've not completed those two uh, workflows there correctly, apologies for that, but the case would be that students would monitor, look at the, the model answer, and they'd need to then have a reflective activity to allow them to compare the model answer to their own work. There's a big risk if you just release a model answer that students don't actually know what they're doing with it. And um, actually, if I just copy this through, this is actually a case from a couple of years ago now, where I worked with a colleague in social policy, and we looked at different forms of assessment, I put, put that in the text chat box, um, and model answer was one of those, and the students didn't respond very well to it, and the, part of the reason I think for that was um, that we didn't show them how to use that model answer, and how to uh, use the model answer with criteria and their own work, so that we're missing that closing of the feedback loop, loop almost, there wasn't any dialogue um, or even sort of informally uh, about how the students work and the model answer related to each other. So the, the adaptive release settings um, look like this. It can be applied to any item on the VLE. So you just add your model answer as a standard text item, then go to the settings and then adaptive release. And within that, um, you can then specify a date or time, which you can do normally, but also um, align it to a grade center. So this is where a student submits a piece of work using the standard assessment tool, a blog, um, or there's a checkbox actually you can put on the VLE. So have I done this particular piece of work? The student ticks a checkbox and they get access to um, uh, a particular resource. So you can use that as an adaptive release mechanism. Quizzes can also be used. So if a student's got full marks on a quiz, this would then release further um, resources or any mark in fact and we use that for the academic integrity tutorial so student has to get full marks on, on first quiz before they get access to the second quiz before they get access to the third quiz so adaptive release can be quite powerful to to lead students through particular resources but also useful if you want to make sure students submit something before you give them a an answer later on there are some considerations though when you're using a model answer approach. The biggest one is actually to do with the time taken to create a model answer. Essentially, it's impossible to create a perfect answer for the students um, when you're doing sort of written work. So there is that element that you need to give students some advice on how they might compare their own answer to the model answer. And you also need to think about how you're going to take um, students learning through that process of engaging with the model answer and feeding that forward to subsequent assessments. So one way might be having a follow-up activity in class. The third option, uh, sorry, the, we've done our three options. The, the plus one is to use a, a Google Docs uh, workflow. And um, there's a link there to uh, some advice on using Google Docs for from our Technology Enhanced Learning Handbook. This, however, is a non-anonymous process. Um, the peer assessment tool is completely anonymous. The blog tool can be used uh, in an anonymous way. And the adaptive release, well, that is it's a more of a self-assessment um, aspect. So by that definition, it is anonymous. But uh, the Google Docs isn't as anonymous as it could be. Um, it, it requires knowing which student um, has submitted what, but also when we look at the commenting functionality, it adds on student names. So first of all, the lecturer would create a Google Doc where students would share links to their work. They would then create work in a, in a Google Doc of their own and share that with other students and then put that link onto the main Google Doc and then students would access from the main Google Doc links to all the other students' work. Now you could use a Google Sheet and this is actually an example I'm gonna show you in a second uh, for managing that. But it could be arguably a more authentic type of peer assessment because you're using an application that will have some relevance beyond their time at the university. So it doesn't have to be a Google document, it could be a PowerPoint presentation i.e. using Google Slides, it could be data analysis using Google Sheets, or it could be another Google app, so Google Fusion Tables and the visualizations you can get through that. So it offers more opportunity and more authentic use of tools, but is not anonymous and requires a lot more guidance because it's not a structured workflow like you would get with the peer assessment tool within the VLE. 
So it could be a little bit more challenging to monitor student engagement as well. So there's the visualization. So we've got students um, submitting all their work. They put their links into a central space. Um, so here is a Google document. The student would go to the share function at the top. And then they would set that quite easily to be anyone at the University of York with the link to make life easier. But they'd set that so that students could only comment, not change the document. And then they take the link that appears at the top of the sharing box and stick that on something like a Google Sheet. So you can see here the student's name, um, they could add that in, it doesn't have to be, um, but it makes it life easier for you as an assessor, um, sort of a lecturer checking things that are taking place that you've got names. Uh, and then once it's been peer assessed, the peer assessing student would then check in there that they've peer assessed. You might even want to put their initials in or some other indicator. And then when they're going in, they can add comments at any point in the document. Um, so here you can see I could just type a comment by highlighting some text and then clicking the add comment um, option. So it offers a, a way of doing inline commenting, which is, uh, can be quite useful rather than just summary comments with um, the peer assessment tool. There is, however, no marking criteria embedded within the workflow. Uh, there is still a manual allocation of work, a uh, manual, manual way of sharing the document, and it may be very difficult to manage large cohorts. But there's also that social dimension as well. By it being non-anonymous, um, you ha might have some um, difficulties where you have students uh, being aware of who's provided feedback, uh, being very, you know, they are very much exposing themselves. So again, this might work better perhaps for postgraduate, perhaps for smaller cohorts where there is an established um, trust within the group. So we've looked there at uh, three uh, supported tools through the VLE and another workflow that might work through Google Apps. There are some recommendations that come out from the literature. Now these ones come out from um, the non-digital peer assessment workflow. And uh, Falchikov and Goldfinch actually conducted a meta-analysis comparing peer assessment in different disciplines, which is where they get these recommendations from. I think avoid using very large numbers of peers per assessment group is actually quite a, a significant point from just managing the whole process. If you do have large cohorts, break them down into smaller groups so that your peer assessment groups are more manageable and you can monitor the behavior uh, within those groups. The second point I'm gonna come back to, uh, but the third point here on um, using assessment criteria and uh, using a global mark rather than building up lots of little pieces of, of marks um, is appropriate for some form of assessments but not for others. So if you've got, uh, let's take a presentation for example and you're asking students to peer assess presentations, you might have 10 marks for visual impact, 10 marks for the content, 10 marks for the delivery style. Actually those, those breakdowns there were actually quite useful for students. Whereas if you're doing an, an essay type based assessment, having a numerical mark over the whole essay might be more appropriate. But really need to think about what you want students to learn from this process. If the peer feedback is helping students to reflect on their own behavior and how they might develop, then for the presentation aspect, then that certainly could work quite well breaking it down. But then you have to question, well, what's the value of a mark? A specific mark for a written piece of work where perhaps the feedback might be more beneficial. So going back to that original example from the literature I showed you earlier where students were spending more too much time focusing on, on the criteria not enough time on the whole experience that might be something to consider. The fourth point I think is very valuable um, particularly where you have um, small groups in a non-anonymous um, setting get them to decide their own criteria. And actually it could be quite interesting to get them to map that to what you think as a lecturer, what the most important criteria could be as well. Again, learning a learning process there about what is the value of the assessment that's being done. Falkotroff and Goldfinch found that uh, peer assessment can be useful at any level, uh, not just undergraduate, not just postgraduate, not just um, traditional subjects, but all sorts of subjects. But then they made a strange point in the second point here where this, again, this was reflecting just on the uh, mental analysis they conducted. It wasn't as successful mapping students' marks against tutor marks in um, practice-based 
practice-based disciplines. So their meta-analysis was whether students' marks accurately reflected um, staff marks, but perhaps again, that's not the most relevant point here as shown through the case study from uh, uh, education department and in particular from um, Lillian, your suggestion there about how it might be worth um, using this in programming. Um, the traditional academic setting probably isn't as valid uh, a consideration here um, as, as it needs to be. Three further points arose from using online peer assessment. Now, Jones and Alcock um, didn't use normal peer assessment method. In, in fact, they went way beyond uh, what we can support. They had um, a math, they were testing mathematical conceptual understanding, and the method they used was quite interesting. They didn't have any marking criteria at all. All they asked were students to rank two assessments they had, one higher than the other, which one was better than the other, and they used the data from the entire um cohorts to then order all the assessments in the, in that cohort which is quite an uh, interesting approach definitely worth reading I'm not sure i agree with it entirely but i know i'm going to hold judgment too far on that um but what they did find out is because they were using a slightly uh, more technically orientated process that you do need to really support students technical training and that means absolutely in a face-to-face -face session showing them the workflow providing the guides and using the screenshots that are relevant now we can help you with that of course within the team here so we can help you write those guides and we can deliver that training first of all as well they found an interesting point though about student motivation um, it, because students were being asked to rank one or higher than the other um, some students were using a gaming behavior um, and uh, they didn't agree with the whole process of peer assessment so were skewing um, all the results so that's something's worth um, bearing in mind if you're going to be using these for summative assessment results um, but there is a, a more uh, if you can couch it within a reflective exercise, so i.e. showing the benefit of students engaging with this process for their summative assessment or building um, some requirement into the summative assessment for engaging with this in, uh, in a thoughtful way, um, that might get over that. Students also wanted reassurance over the quality of the assessment and whether students were um, judging based on their own understanding or misconceptions uh, correctly or incorrectly so you may need to include some form of conceptual understanding now that means that when you're putting your criteria in giving examples of what um, a good answer or the right answer might be for um, particular criteria or particular answers so in summary then we've looked at four tools here the peer assessment tool which i think will be best for small groups but it allows automated um, functions blog-based task great for large uh, cohorts and groups we've got plenty of case studies where blogs are being used for reflective practice um, adaptive release to um, release content uh, but it does require some sort of scaffolded activity around that and google docs for inline feedback it's a more manual process not anonymous and probably needs a lot of trust between the cohort as well the different types of learning uh, understanding criteria assessed feedback so feedback as a skill show understanding reflection learning from others and applying to practice other forms of peer learning and this is where i think kathy you might be interested in this um, there was a case study i think it's raising all i need to check that um, but i have found a case study where um, in class polling tools we're currently doing a trial of response where actually which is in class um, polling clicker using a mobile phone um, was used to assess students presentations in the class itself so that could be a very useful way of using peer assessment within the class within a particular framework um, but Mazur and um, his work uh, Eric Mazur um, did a lot of work on peer explanation justification in class so delivering content getting students to um, check their own conceptual understanding with quizzes trying to explain to their peers their understanding and justifying their answer with some sort of confidence level as well put into that and then responding again to the quiz um, to show a change in understanding as a result of that discussion is quite significant. So a lot of work on, from Mazur and his team um, in that idea of in class. But you could also use um, other forms of peer learning such as getting students to create learning resources for use in subsequent, subsequent years, creating the resources, maybe a video tutorial, getting students to critique that video tutorial, and then using that to refine the resource for use in subsequent years. 
Um, another form of peer learning that might be facilitated by online tools, uh, for example, um, what we're using now, Collaborate Ultra, um, is student-led seminars. Um, so rather than assessing on um, individual pieces of work, getting students to do some peer discussions together, led by students um, from higher um, academic years. So there's a link in the reference there to Hang et al. and others um, from 2013 that explains um, that process in more detail. So I've covered quite a lot there, but I just want to give you a flavour of the tools and some of the workflows you might want to adopt um, to facilitate peer assessment and consequentially peer learning using the VLE. Are there any questions? I'd be interested to see whether any of this has been relevant. Um, it's okay to say no, and it's okay if you'd like to focus on something slightly different um, as well. So if you want to put into the text chat box or raise your hand, and open your microphone and, and share what your thoughts are, um, perhaps where might you take this forward next? Um, do share that now. Absolutely, Rolena. I will send you the link to the references. Uh, they're all available through the university catalogue as well. Yes, Cathy, I think you might be right there in terms of uh, the group-based uh, marking of presentations. Um, I'm aware that Theatre, Film and TV have worked with um, Tom from um, the IT uh, teaching learning team uh, with Google Apps. Um, he's, they've created quite an interesting model of um, collating student marks and then doing some um, mathematics on it uh, to come up with a final mark. Um, so yes, you could use the, their Google workflow for collecting student marks. But I think it might be also worth considering um, using the blog tool as that formative process as well. So not just seeing the end product, but the process gives you an idea of um, and maybe a deeper understanding of uh, the literature presented in the presentation. One other aspect you might want to consider as well with uh, presentations is that we will be able to help support you recording student presentations and um, you could embed the recordings of group presentations within the VLE within a blog space and then getting students to uh, provide feedback on individual presentations that way as well. Uh, so Lillian's got a cohort of um, 166. Um, I think if you, yeah, uh, peer assessment in the in the tool that the, the first tool I showed you um, could be quite challenging unless you set up a separate VLE site just for peer assessment. And then once students have submitted, um, once that deadline's passed, you remove all the students who didn't engage, get rid of them, they've missed their opportunity. And so only those that have submitted work will actually go through the, with the second and third stages of the peer assessment process. So that could work in within a specific, if we created a separate module site just for that peer assessment process, certainly feasible to do that. Um, Otherwise, yes, it would be something along the lines of um, a group-based uh, activity within the VLE. With 166, that's, a, that's a, a lot to deal with, but the automated peer assessment tool could work if you set it up as a separate site and remove users who didn't engage early on. Hello, Terry. Yes, uh, so... Uh, perhaps peer marking cohort 185. Again, um, getting the peer assessment tool within the VLE would be the, the most useful tool for that. But again, you'd probably need to set up as a separate um, site. I know it's a little bit of a, an odd process, uh, but I think it could work for um, doing something like that. Um, alternatively, of course, um, just thinking here whether there's another alternative to for just getting marks on work. Um, one approach might be group, again, dividing the group down into small blog groups instead. Um, that could be an alternative. Uh, so Richard uh, Walker uh, just pointed out there is a case study on um, using blogs with small groups uh, in a non-anonymous way. Um, that's on our uh, Yorktown handbook as well. Um, I'll try and send that link out when I send the slides out as well. Um, Tom, Tom, 
I've completely forgotten his last name, so one of the team will have to shout out and help me with this one. Tom Smith, there we are. Uh, Tom Smith um, in IT uh, has worked with TFTV on Ollie in TFTV um, on a uh, Mark based Google Sheets application. Yeah, uh, thanks very much to. Yes, actually, Michelle, you put in there um, about um, how do you motivate, essentially, how do you motivate students uh, using a, a blog-based activity? Again, one of the things I found uh, really motivational on my course uh, was when it's part of the summative assessment criteria that you have to reflect on your formative learning activities. Um, so if that can give a bit of motivation, I don't know what, what else would, but um, the other aspect as well is when you've got that link between the online task and face-to-face uh, -face activity. So if you are using a large cohort, for example, and you're doing something based on seminars, drawing upon the blog work in the seminars provides that motivation for students as well, because um, obviously they're then talking about something that's very relevant to them. So creating those links between online and face-to-face -face is quite valuable. Uh, if you look at the fourth section of the York Tell handbook, um, that will help out with that. Let me just see if I can give you a link to that straight away. Uh, we're talking more detail about the way that um, you can embed activities as part of uh, the overall module design there. Yep, a separate submission site. All you'd need to do is um, request it from your home tab on the VLE. Just request a new module site to be created, um, put into the description there that you want it for peer assessment and we can set up uh, could students submit to Turnitin and then only those who engage be passed on to peer mark? Uh, Turnitin wouldn't be possible in this case um, because we only use Turnitin for um, text matching um, for plagiarism checking. So we don't use Turnitin for marking processes. Okay, thank you very much for your participation and I hope that's been useful. I know that's not given you a, a definitive one-stop shop answer, unfortunately, um, but that's the way that learning technology goes. There are different tools for different um, processes, pros and cons of each, and hopefully we'll find a solution that works best for you. Thank you very much. <laughs>